Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're so happy and grateful that we are gathering again in our, our home, our church. Um, and I see so many smiling faces here. It makes me so happy inside. Um, I, I just want to give a scripture and a real short prayer this morning as we open up into worship. I um, was just thinking this morning how many different groups are unified. And when they have a purpose, they become really tight and driven. And as a church, we need to do the same thing. And sometimes I think we lack that drive, that goal, that setting our face like a flint. So we're going to open up in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And this was written by Paul. And if we were all like Paul, the world would never be the same. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endearing to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Wow. If we could only do that, right? We treat each other with lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, and joining to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of you, who is above all and through all, in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So Lord, this morning I pray that we would be one in you. We would be one in the Father. We would be one um, in, in um, yes. the Holy Spirit. Yes. We would allow the Holy Spirit to move abundantly through us and with yes, us. Lord, that we would be tied together, unable yes. to break away. Lord, be with us today. Do it, Lord. Be with us today in this congregation, whether they're in, we're in person or we're virtual. Lord, be with us today. And may your Holy Spirit move in worship yes. and in the communion message and in the word. Dear God, move yes. abundantly. Yes. May we feel your Holy Spirit. Glory. In Jesus' name. Glory. Amen. thank God thank God to be able to look out and see uh, uh, Lord Harvest as a not just one or two people just as a whole it is, it's a blessing it's wonderful and you know God is good when you can look out and see so many healthy strong spirit people just worshiping him <laughs> and I, 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 I man I think I think I thank God just to be a part of it um you know this is you know just for for those out um, that's at home those that can't make it God is 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 still moving in your home but those of you that can, come. He said, forsake not, your, forsake not yourselves from partaking with one another, enjoying with one another, sharing with one another. See, he gave his life so that we can share with others. We shared in his death but he died and we benefit from it. Amen. Come on now. Yeah. Come on. His, his blood and his body, man, I couldn't have done it. I thank him for that. Amen. And I remember it so vividly 
sometimes when he comes through for me in a in a clutch you know how you know it might be a bill need to be paid or a blessing over here and he comes through and i'm like man god praise your name so this morning let's let's go over to first corinthians 11 let's just see you know what what brother paul has to say you know we we thank you we thank you let's go let's go to verse this first corinthians 11 it's starting uh Let's start in 23. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. Yeah. Praise God. Now, powerful thing here is the powerful thing here is he knew he was going to die. How does somebody that know they're going to soon die say, hey, take this bread. This is, my, this, this is a powerful moment here in the upper room. Take, take this, this bread. This is my body. Let's partake. This Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Those of you at home, get a, get a piece of bread, get, you, get some juice, get, get it, and just partake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you do do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You're proclaiming. You're saying, yeah, Jesus, thank you. Oh, <laughs> let us, let us drink. Thank you, God. Father, hmm. um, Addison, Catherine, the Lord has, it, it's, are you believing God for something? <laughs> God said it's coming. He said it's coming. I, I wish he would show me what it is. I'm, I'm curious now. <laughs> But he said it's coming. He said it's coming in Jesus' name. Amen? But but anyway, but anyway, God, we thank you for your body and your blood. We thank you that you obeyed the Father. And then the Holy Spirit obeyed you. <laughs> and now we obey the Holy Spirit. Your, your joy, your joy makes me happy. I go up and down throughout the day, but it's his joy that makes me happy because I know he has my back. Yes. Yeah. Father God, we just thank you this morning yes. for this powerful, powerful, uh, sacrificial, offering of your body God and sharing it with us 
that we can be stronger and that we can know that you love us and that you are still there for us regardless of COVID or whatever it is. You are still there, Lord God, and we praise you. We lift up your name, oh high God. We thank you, Jesus. Because nobody else could have done what you've done. <laughs> and I thank you, I do, because man, from day to day, yeah, I have problems, but I always take them to Jesus, and he always give me some kind of answer. Amen. If, he say, if he, he might say, Bird, that was your fault over there. Because <laughs> I'm still, I'm still human. I'm still in this flesh, but I try, I try every day by the grace of God to move in the spirit as much as I can. Amen. That's it. As much as I can. Because I know that God has provided a way for me to get it done. And that's to just keep going. Amen. We thank you, God. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. What I want to do today is just summarize our last 14 months and what the Lord has spoken to us. For a year, we were in the Psalms, and the Lord showed us a five-fold pattern based on the five different books of the Psalms on how he establishes his purposes in the earth. And then we've spent several months in Isaiah. And in Isaiah, the servant of the Lord is manifested. Isaiah 40 through 55. And four times the servant and the servant's purpose is addressed in Isaiah 40 through 55. That's a fourfold pattern of what the ministry of the servant of the Lord and God's servants, whom we are, the third thing we looked at was Colossians 1, and there's a fourfold pattern there on how leadership in the church, apostolic leadership in the church, imparts grace to the church to be discipled and to enter into the purposes of the Lord. I, I, I want to summarize that so we can all get on the same page, both those of us who are here and those of us who are online. The Lord has spoken to me since we've been meeting live again for these past several weeks. <clears throat> the Lord has spoken to me that we have arrived. <clears throat> what the Lord has promised is being fulfilled. And we just need to open our eyes to see it. The Lord's going to dig out our ears. He's going to open our eyes. It's not, Lord, what are you going to do so that we know you're, you're fulfilling these things? He started several weeks ago. The Spirit's been poured out here every Sunday, and it's going to continue to be poured out. He's doing it now. And that really echoes several times um, in my walk in the Lord and my relationship with my beloved brother, Steve Fado that Steve has prophesied the same thing to me a number of years ago when, for me, the, the failure of Lord of the Harvest was being heightened and underscored, and I, I actually believed we weren't going to survive what we were going through a number of years ago. Steve took me aside and said, Oz, it's in times like these that the Lord proves his faithfulness to you and the promises he's made to you and the covenant he's made to you. And I remember that word from Steve changed me significantly in terms of how I saw what God was doing, how God did, does things, and, and, and how God establishes his purposes. And then recently, Steve called me out as I was ministering. 
and uh, he uh, said, I had a vision, Oz. The Lord is faithful. You, Lord of the harvest, you have not compromised. You've been faithful to the promises of the Lord. And he said, and the Lord is going to fulfill all his promises to you, brother. That's, that's just what the Lord spoke. That was several weeks ago, and it's, it's, it's as if the, the scales have fallen off my eyes. Of course, they've fallen off my eyes these last 14 months. There will be churches who said, we stood firm for the Lord. We, we never stopped meeting. We, we don't believe in masks. You know, we don't believe in lockdowns and stuff. We stood firm in the Lord, and God's fulfilled his promises to us. And I would say to that, amen. And then there'll be a church, like Lord of the Harvest said, we closed down, we wore masks, we, 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 we uh, social distanced. We were as careful as you can be. We didn't even meet together, and the Lord fulfilled Amen. everything Amen. he yes. promised to us. Amen. We have to, as the body of Christ, come out of this sectarian, one size fits all. Right. One size does not fit all. And we have to quit judging each other yes. because your experience is not affirming my experience. My brothers and sisters in Christ do not need to affirm my experience. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That's, that's all we need to affirm our experience. Amen. And may those who obey the Lord, whatever the Lord has showed them to do, be blessed right now. May they be blessed. See, we, we, we can't see church. We can't do church through a sectarian perspective. A sectarian perspective is my way is the way. Well, that's not what I meant to talk on today, but figure if it, if it works, it works. Hallelujah. So let's look first at the Psalms. We spent a year in the Psalms. I didn't want to get out of the Psalms. I didn't want to depart. I mean, I was afraid to say, let's go to another scripture and look at them. We, we spent an entire year. Wasn't that amazing? One Psalm a day for 366 days and just seeing Psalm 1 through 150 is a plan. Those, those Psalms are not just thrown together arbitrarily. Psalm 1 was put where it was put. Psalm 42 was put where it was put. Psalm 89 was put where it was put. Psalm 106 and 107 were put exactly where they should be, and Psalm 150 was put exactly where it should be. And there was a plan, and by spending a year, we saw the five-fold pattern. There are five books in, Gen in Psalms. The Genesis book, the Exodus book, the Numbers book, oh, the, Levitical, the Leviticus book, the Numbers book, and then the book of Deuteronomy, but that, that five-fold scheme also goes through the history of Israel. The Genesis book, Psalms 1 through 41, speak of that the Lord established David's kingship. It was a miracle. The Lord set one presidential candidate down and raised up another presidential candidate. Saul goes down, David goes up. That's the first five books, and it says that when God has a purpose with a man, with a people, with a church, God will establish it against yes. all odds. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's good. Principle number one in the Psalms. Principle number two, the, the Exodus book runs from Psalm 42 through Psalm 72. Not only does God establish a king, but then he sustains that kingship. Every attack against David, human, demonic, national, theological, spiritual, every attack against David, the Lord repels and sustains his 
kingship. He doesn't just establish his kingship, he sustains his kingship because what was key about David's kingship, it, it's to sustain a kingship. The Lord made a promise to David and said, from your seed, I will raise up an anointed one who will establish my kingdom purposes forever. Now we know that's Jesus. We know, we, we know way, way, way beyond David. A thousand years after David lived and died that it would be Jesus. But in order, in order for the kingship to be sustained, Solomon had to be the one who received the kingship. And David went through a number of sons who actually had the, the inheritance before Solomon, but in the end, the Lord establishes Solomon. So God establishes his purpose. He sustains his purpose. But then an interesting thing happens. The third book, Psalm 73 through Psalm 89, is that Israel becomes divided after Solomon. It's divided between Israel and Judah. And you know, God's people, even as we seek to establish God's purposes, after God has established us and sustained us, the thing that stops the purposes of the Lord from being fulfilled, that causes the church, that causes God's people to go into exile is division. Division. And Israel separates from Judah because they're divided from the Lord to begin with. They're not obedient to the Lord. Our See, our disobedience to the Lord manifests itself in how we treat each other. You know, when a family is going wrong, they fight with each other. Husband and wife, parents and children, siblings, they fight among each other. That's a sign, though, that something greater than just personal issues is at work. And so Psalm 89 ends with this, this great psalm that says, Lord, you promised all these things to David. You said your steadfast love, your faithfulness would prevail. And now our land has been divided and all division leads is to exile. It, it leads to a forcible removal from the land. It leads to debt slavery. When, when slavery in the Old Testament, when you got into debt, you had to sell yourself to somebody else to pay that debt off. And after seven years or 50 years, you'd be restored. But see, exile is debt slavery. It's because we build up debts by not being obedient to the Lord, by not paying our bills, so to speak. You know, you pay your bills to the Lord by being obedient to the Lord. So they go into exile, and the Psalm 89 says, but Lord, you promised, you promised David. And now, what happened in exile? When they went into exile in Assyria and Babylon, the 12 tribes are carried away. Guess what's missing? There's no more king. But wait a second, Lord, how can your pr promises be fulfilled if the king you established, if the king you sustained, if the nation that you've raised up is in exile and we're gone from the land and the temple's destroyed in the city, how will we survive? And then book four starts out with Psalm 90, the prayer of the man of God, Moses. And it takes us back to a time before David, before any kingship, when all you had was an anointed prophet named Moses. And you know what that prophet did? How did that prophet get Israel from Egypt into the promised land? Very simple. I mean, he told the people what to do, the people didn't do it. See, that's, that's the, the bane of pastoring. You can get up and say, all I have to do is if I just teach these people, the right way to do it will be all right. And you teach and you teach and you teach and you teach. For 40 years you teach and people don't listen to what you're teaching. How did Moses get them when they didn't listen? He prayed. Moses prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And Psalm 90 through Psalm 106, the fourth book of the Psalms, it's dominated by Moses. 
All the times that Moses is mentioned in the entire 150 Psalms, all but one are found in 90 to 106. Moses prays. And what also happens in those Psalms is you have a series of Psalms that run from Psalm 93 to Psalm 100 where it's the kingship of the Lord that is established. Lord, how are we going to do it without a human king? Well, the way I intended it to be all along, all along. I'm the king. Amen. Amen. That's it. And you see, human failure, human failure, all it is is a prelude for the Lord to stand up in our midst and say, yeah, your parents have failed you. Your president has failed you. Your spouse has failed you. Your kids have failed you. Your pastors have failed you. But I will not fail you. And it takes 106 psalms to understand that the Lord functions through death and resurrection. We die. He's raised up. And because he lives, we also shall live. Never despise the day of abject failure. This, is, this has been the story of my pastoring life. Well, Lord, I've failed again. You, you have these moments and it appears like you've succeeded only to come to the inevitability of, I've failed again, Lord. You have these situations with your children. I've failed again, Lord. You have these situations with your spouse. I've failed you again, Lord. You have these situations with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I've failed you again, Lord. You have the situation with the neighborhood in which God has placed you. I've failed again, Lord. And the Lord says, no problem. Because I haven't failed. And then the fifth and final book of the Psalms, it's all celebration, yes. rejoicing in whom? The great leaders you have? No. The great disciple-making pastor you have? The great parents you had? The great parents you were? No, our rejoicing is in the Lord. Yes. And he lifts us up, and as Steve Fado says, Oz... It's in times like these that the Lord shows he is faithful yes. to his covenant promises. So that was part one. We spent a year in the Psalms, and that's what we learned. God is faithful. Yes. This, how does the Lord establish his, his, his purpose in the earth? Well, he does raise up godly leaders. He, he, he provides resources and sustains those godly leaders. But if those godly leaders fail, life doesn't end. If you yourself fail, life doesn't end. You keep looking to him, you keep pressing into him. He is faithful. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a syntactical, semantic argument going on in the body of Christ. You know, it's not just theologians that argue. Exegetes argue. They argue about the way the language is. The, the expression in the New Testament that's translated in many of our translations that we are to have faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know that phrase can also be translated that we are to have the faith of Jesus Christ. Not faith in Jesus. The faith of. And that what the phrase can actually mean the faith of Jesus Christ could actually be translated the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. What are we saved? Are we saved by our faith in Jesus or are we saved by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ? Yeah. And by the way, that's a profound difference there, brother. Yeah. And which one of those you believe is true is going to change the way you live. It's going to change the way you see reality. See, and that's why in the Psalms we saw it over and over and over again. The steadfast love and the faithfulness yes. of the Lord. Yes. And see, the steadfast love and the faithfulness of the Lord is the grace and truth 
that are found in Jesus Christ. So the second place we went was the servant of the Lord in Isaiah. In Isaiah 42, in Isaiah 49, in Isaiah 50, and Isaiah 53. You have the fourfold mission of the servant of the Lord. God's people are in exile, but the Lord's going to bring them back, and he's going to establish his purposes, and he's going to establish it through the servant. See, Isaiah 40 through 55 follows the same pattern as 150 Psalms do. It's the faithfulness of the servant. So in Isaiah 42, the servant, first of all, seeks to bring justice. Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Three times the word justice is stated. The first way that the Lord establishes his purposes through Jesus will be justice. The Lord will bring justice. And as I said, you know, if, if you say the Lord will bring faith or the Lord will bring love or the Lord will bring righteousness or the Lord will bring power, you don't, even, you don't have to define the word. Everybody has an image of what love is and faith is and power and righteousness. But again, I'm telling you, the church doesn't know what justice is. It's for some reason, the church has gotten away from paying attention to justice. Well, one of the reasons the church has gotten away from paying attention to justice and talking about justice and teaching justice is the church hasn't walked in justice for centuries. And I'm talking about way before 1619. I'm talking about way before 1514. I'm talking about way before 980 A.D., way before the mid-7th century A.D. I'm talking about way before the church got away from justice. The church got away from justice because it embraced political power as a means to establish God's kingdom instead of God's way. So the first aspect that the servant brings is justice. And if God is going to move in this hour in the church, I'm not going to define justice. For I define it every time I share. But, but if the church is going to get in step with what the Lord is doing in this hour, the Lord is trying to take the scales off the eyes of his church and embrace justice once again. You cannot embrace justice because justice, the main thing about justice is justice is for everyone else. It's not for me. See, see if I live a life driven for, for me and mine, if I live a life that's driven by, I want my tribe, I want my tradition, I want my people to experience the blessings of the Lord, you, you already have placed yourself in a position against even understanding what justice is. The first thing the servant does, the first thing in bringing Israel back from exile, in re rebuilding the city, in rebuilding the walls, in rebuilding the temple, and in inviting the Lord in to be a habitation in their midst, is justice. Isaiah 49, the mission of the Lord must be established. That's the second servant song. And the mission of the Lord is not only for God's people, it's for the nations of the earth. It has to be inclusive, not exclusive. And that mission will be characterized by the opposition of warfare that that mission brings to the servant. So justice first, warfare second. The third servant song is Isaiah 50, and I taught it, was it last week? Last week I taught Isaiah 50, discipleship. The servant who is seeking to establish justice, the servant who is on seeking to establish God's mission in the earth, even against all the warfare that will come against that servant, the third thing the servant does is he raises up disciples to help carry out his task. 
And then the fourth we know in Isaiah 53, it's suffering. The servant bears the sins, bears the infirmities, bears the weaknesses, bears the sickness of God's people upon himself to make the unrighteous righteous and to release healing. There's a fourfold pattern how the Lord establishes his purposes in the earth. And be certain that none of that could happen without Jesus. But also be certain that if we are now his servants, and Paul, remember, Paul called himself the minister of the Lord, the servant of the Lord in Colossians 1. And we're going to go to Colossians 1 next. Actually open your Bibles to Colossians 1. And that's our third summary of what we've looked at in this last year. But if we are the servants of the Lord, then we must understand justice and bring justice. Number two, we must recognize that we will be opposed by every force that is possible in establishing the mission of the Lord. We cannot expect that this mission is going to be easy. We need to expect warfare. We need to be prepared for warfare and we need to press through warfare. Third, we need to make disciples. And we make disciples, as Isaiah 50 said, we open our ears to be discipled by the Lord and then the Lord will give us a tongue to open the ears of others to be disciples. And then fourth, we need to be prepared to suffer. And you're going to see the fourfold pattern in Colossians 1 where Paul talks about apostolic ministry. You're going to see very uh, many similarities. And we're not going to read through all of Colossians 1 because I spent several weeks online teaching it. Colossians 1 verse 3. Here's the fourfold pattern for apostolic leadership. This is how we make disciples. Number one, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks. It's where discipleship starts. We, the disciplers, have to be thankful people. We have fearful people in the body of Christ. We have angry people in the body of Christ. We have hostile people in the body of Christ. You know, if you listen to enough Christian talk radio, which I don't know whether Christian talk radio gave it to worldly talk radio or the Christians just borrowed the world. It's like the the more hostile we are, the more we defend our territory, the more we defend our rights, the more we defend our tribe, the more we defend our, our political view. Christians act like that's what we're called to do. Well, if Jesus were here today, he'd phone in and say, you know not what manner of spirit you are that's of. Right. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy people's lives. Yeah but to save people's lives. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And, and what's becoming this, this hostile, nasty spirit, it's becoming enshrined in the church right now. No, none of those are thankful spirits. Fearful spirits, angry spirits, hostile spirits. Those aren't thankful spirits. Negative spirits, thankful spirits, that's where the fourfold pattern of discipleship starts. It starts in worship. Yes. Amen. It starts in the last three weeks I have experienced the presence of the Lord yes. and it has just made my spirit thankful. That's the first step. The second step is 
verse 9. Paul says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, the, the faith and the hope and the love that's in the midst of the Colossians people, do not cease to pray for you. Prayer is the second dimension of apostolic impartation that creates discipleship. And what's he praying for them? Look, he's praying for an impartation, that you be filled with the knowledge of his will, in wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing unto him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, that you're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. And then notice he says, giving thanks to the Father. Just as I give thanks, I'm praying that you'll have an impartation of thankfulness. And that impartation of thankfulness, that's like the delivery service. The impartation of thankfulness, that's like the supernatural Uber driver bringing you your food, making you thankful in your heart. Not making you suspicious, not making you antagonistic, not making you territorial, making you thankful. And notice, it's a prayer for an impartation of these things. See, see, just as Moses prayed in the fourth book of the Psalms to get God's people from Egypt to the Promised Land, apostolic leadership, we are praying and praying and praying again. The third thing we do is in verse 28. Verse 27 actually talks about um, God is willing to make known to the church what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among you Gentiles, which is Christ in your midst, the hope of glory. See, see that verse does not say Christ in you as if Jesus is this personal possession that you have to hang on to and fight everybody else off. The, the inheritance is the Greek is Christ in your midst. It's a corporate Christ in the middle of all of God's people, possessed by no one, possessed by all of us as we come together in Christ. That's the mystery. The mystery is, is that I don't look at my brothers and sisters who voted different from me, who have a different perspective from me on the vaccination or whatever other conflicts are out there who have different perspectives on race or who have different understandings of justice. I don't look at them and say, oh, you don't see what I see. You're wrong. No, I say, where are you in the midst of us, Lord? Ah, you're in the midst of all of us, yes. regardless of those other issues that are secondary unimportant, yep. insignificant yes. issues. Christ in our midst is the hope of glory. See, I mean, Christ is in me. That's just not what Paul is talking about here. I'm in Christ. That's, that's also not what Paul is describing here. What Paul is describing here is this hope of glory is when we come together as brothers and sisters and, and we got a whole church and there's one of this color and one of that color and one of this political persuasion and one of that political persuasion and one who thinks this way about tongues and another who thinks another way about tongues and we look around and Jesus is in the midst of all of us. Yes. That's hope. That's hope because again it says it's not up to me. It's not even up to us. It's up to him, and he is revealing himself in the midst of us, and that gives me hope. Yes. See, the, the, personally, I, and I've told people this, the way I'm wired, I, I, I could do Zoom meetings for the rest of my life, and I, I wouldn't give a hoot whether I met with anybody personally or not. Because that's just the way I'm wired. All I need is my Bible and Jesus. That's all I need. Oh, and some worship songs on the side. I don't, and my dog, and my wife. Okay, as long as I have that, I'm happy. Come on. 
But you know what I'm missing when we're not together? The hope of glory. Yes. Because when I come together with my brothers and sisters in Christ and we're worshiping together, yes. oh my gosh, yes. I, I get launched to the heaven of heavens. Yes. Yes. Maybe at home with my wife and dog and, and my Greek and Hebrew interlinears, I'm in heaven. But I'm in the heaven of heavens when I'm with my brothers yes. and sisters. Because I got all those other things as well too. And you know, when we were thinking that, you know, I did send out that Channel 2 news bulletin that there was somebody, potentially a very dangerous person, you know, loose in the neighborhood and, and we needed a watch for him. I told my wife, I said, I looked under the bed. That's where my dog is. I looked under the bed and said, I can bring you to church today. You can be the guard dog to watch us. But doggone it, they, they apprehended the guy. So, you know, we... <laughs> But verse 28, it's the third principle. Because it's saying, Christ in your midst, the hope of glory. <laughs> They're coming to arrest me now. Get rid of that guy, he's out of his mind. Verse 28, him we proclaim. Yes. See, the third way that we bring this impartation is we proclaim Jesus. So we give thanks. We pray, we proclaim, and then verse 24 is the fourth one. Paul says, I now rejoice in my suffering for you. What was the fourth servant song? He suffered. He brought justice, he did spiritual warfare, he made disciples, and he suffered for the people of God. Paul says, I now rejoice in my suffering for you. Paul was in jail when he wrote Colossians and he would be executed a few years later. Never got out of that jail. He would be executed. Now, you know, when bad things happen, we always say, Lord, why is this happening to me? Well, here's the answer if you're a leader in the body of Christ. Christological suffering. You have to have a Christological perspective of suffering. You have to understand why bad things happen to you and why you suffer. It's for everybody else who is unwilling to suffer. He says, I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. See, the church, the, the hardest thing to get the body of Christ to do is to suffer. You can get the body of Christ to worship, you can get the body of Christ to study the Bible. You can get the body of Christ to tithe. You can get the body of Christ to pray. You can get the body of Christ to do outreach. But it's very difficult to get the body of Christ to suffer. It, it is. It's very difficult for any of us to suffer. Who, 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 who in their right mind would want to do that? Well, see, we're not in our right mind when we're following Jesus. Do you understand? You're not in your right mind. You're following Jesus. Jesus, they, they said he was insane. That's right. His own family said, yeah. you're nuts. Exactly. And why did they accuse him of being nuts? Because he was just doing what he saw the Father do. Yeah. If people don't think you're crazy, you might not be listening to Jesus. <laughs> because the Father said, oh, son, here's the icing on the cake. Justice, son. Warfare, establish the mission, make disciples, heal the sick, raise the dead. And see, the church is calling. We want signs and wonders. We want to heal the sick and raise the dead. The ultimate sign and wonder, Isaiah 8 said, I and the children you've given me, the disciples you've given me, we are for signs and wonders in Israel. See, a church following Jesus apostolically, that's the ultimate sign and wonder. And the biggest hindrance, church, to what God wants you is not faith. Oh, I lack faith, if only I had a little more faith. No, not the biggest hindrance. Oh, if only I had a, a little bit more revelation. Give me revelation. No, not revelation. You don't need more revelation. The biggest hindrance is the church is unwilling to suffer. That's the biggest hindrance. Because who in their right mind is willing to suffer? So, in order for 
impartation for discipleship, those who are really disciples have to suffer. That's what I remember in Isaiah 50, the Lord has opened my ear and I did not draw back, I did not withdraw, I did not abandon the Lord, I gave my back to the smiters, I gave my beard to those who pluck out the hairs. And in Isaiah 50, it's this incredible, read it if you weren't here last week or you didn't listen to the message, read Isaiah 50 verses four through 10. That's talking about Jesus. It's one of the clearest prophecies of the specificities of how he was gonna suffer. He was gonna be beaten, they were gonna pull out the, the, the hairs in his beard, they were gonna crown him with a thorn. They, thorns, they, they were gonna mercilessly beat him. And he said, and the Lord has opened my ear and I did not turn back. I offered my back to the smiters. And that's how the Lord would give the servant the tongue to make disciples. I've, I have suffered a lot in these last 10 years. The first, it's like the Lord kind of divided up the history of the church. First 10 years was celebration, fun, games, God moving powerfully, God moving mightily. I mean, any, everything we touch turned to gold, that Lord of the harvest. And then the second 10 years, it's been suffering, suffering, suffering. And the Lord said, well, those first 10 years were good and then I'll, I'll be bringing that back. But you gotta understand the way I sustain it, the way I impart it is what happened to you in the second 10 years. You keep pressing through. How's, how's your back feel, son? How's, how's your beard feel, son? Man, it hurts, Lord. That's okay. You are gonna impart by your suffering for my people, you're gonna impart to them the grace they need to suffer. Ah, and then we'll have an apostolic church. And Paul says at the last phrase of verse 23, of which I, Paul, became a minister, that servant, and then the first words of verse 25, of which I became a minister, a servant, according to the commission which God has given me. See, he's saying, I'm identifying with the servant of the Lord in Isaiah. And how does he end up making God's people whole, making God's people well, making God's people righteous? By suffering. I'm doing it too. Okay, final, final example. And we'll be, we'll be out of here by noon. Hallelujah. It'll be an eschatological event for Pastor Oz. <laughs> See, another reason why I liked offline, did you guys, for those of you who even yeah. lasted through any of those teachings, did you see how long I taught when we were online? Yeah. Hour 15 to an hour and a half every Sunday. Man, I, I can do this forever, Lord. Just, <laughs> just, I'll just sit here and teach for an hour and a half. I, Lord, I could do this like three or four times a week. I, I'll never have to leave here. I got, I'll put all my books around here. Well, when you get back to live preaching, no can do. All right. The final is something that I've only shared a little bit with, and I'm going to pull up my note here. This is the fourth pattern of what God's doing in our midst. God's doing all of this in our midst. He's doing psalms. He's going to establish his kingship. Yep. He's doing Isaiah, justice, warfare, discipleship, righteousness and healing. He's gonna do it like Colossians, thankfulness, intercessory prayer, proclamation and suffering. He's gonna do it and we're gonna to get to where we wanna go. The last one is, and I, I've, I've shared this with my leaders and I think maybe one of the Bible studies that I, I, I did in kingdom education class on Wednesday nights. Bernard Fuller was on uh, back in May, one of Matt Parker's um, summit teachings, Zoom summit teachings, and, and he said, coming back out of this, whatever we wanna call it is that we've been through these last 14 months or so, he says, coming out of it, there's gonna be a fourfold pattern. So this is my final one. 
I've given you a five fold and two four folds. We'll finish with a four fold one. And he talked about the pattern that we see in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now you know Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther take place exactly when Isaiah 40 through 55, that prophecy was being fulfilled. That prophecy being fulfilled in Isaiah 40 through 55 was being fulfilled when the children of Israel came back from exile. When the children of Israel come back from exile, you have the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So if you are looking for something to study on your own, that's 23 chapters. Divide them each chapter in half and, and it'll take you 46 days to read them or those of you who are speed readers, 23 days. There's a fourfold pattern. Here, this is Bernard Fuller shared this and I, I, I wrote it down. I, wrote it down, it was so powerful, because I said, but that's where we're at. That's Isaiah 40 through 55. Everything that's taking place in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther was prophesied in Isaiah 40, actually through 66, if you want to add that, that whole second part of Isaiah. Here is the reading pattern for the return to church reality. In Ezra chapter 1 through 6, the rebuilding of the temple takes place. We must rebuild the temple. Rebuilding the temple is the church must once again become a place, to quote Pastor Todd Smith, who we've been listening to lately. Those of you who haven't heard of Todd Smith, look up North Georgia Revival on Google. Todd Smith, he was, he was recently down with Steve Fado and Awakened City Church in uh, Knoxville, and there were some pretty powerful miracles that took place there. <clears throat> Todd Smith says the church likes to allow the Holy Spirit to visit, but we don't want to become a habitation where the Lord lives and dwells. So in Ezra 1 through 6, the first step in the return to church reality is the church has to rebuild the temple. The church has to become a place of God's habitation, not a place where God visits. It's got to be a place where God is married to his people, not where God is dating his people. Do, do you understand? There's a big difference. The second step is Ezra 7 through 10. Besides rebuilding the temple, the church has to reform the people of God. He starts out rebuilding the temple, but then in the second half of Ezra, he reforms the people. God's people must be discipled. Yes. If we want the habitation to be sustained, it's going to be sustained among a reformed people. Third is the book of Nehemiah, which is 13 chapters. Nehemiah knows the temple's rebuilt. He knows the people are being reformed. But remember, Nehemiah weeps. Why does he weep? Because the walls are not restored. Do you know that a city, an, an ancient Near Eastern city, was not constituted as a legal city until the walls were rebuilt? The walls speaks, that speaks of divine protection. It's the thing that hedges us in and keeps the rebuilt temple and reformed people safe from the attacks of the enemy. We must rebuild the walls. And we rebuild, that's where we start getting into the Christian disciplines. That's where we get into prayer. That's where we get into faith. That's where we get into the reading of the word. That's where we get into being accountable to each other. We start implementing spiritual practices in the midst of God's people. See, the reason God's people don't do what God says is the walls have been destroyed and have never been rebuilt in the body of Christ. And fourth is the book of Esther. That's rescuing the people. The spirit of Haman wants to destroy God's people. When God's people start moving forward, becoming what they're to become and doing what they're to do, the spirit of Haman wants to destroy the people of God. And so God raises up an Esther generation for such a time as this 
to rescue the people of God. And if you read those three books, you'll find out how we rebuild the temple, how we reform the people, how we restore the walls of Jerusalem, how we rescue the people. I am, I am finished. This is what we are to expect. Now, Teresa, are you up to closing us in prayer? We're going to close in prayer, brethren. God bless you. Love and serve the Lord. Let's see what he's been teaching us and showing us these last 14 months, and let's begin to walk in those ways. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord God, for this time together. Lord God, we are just so excited to be gathered together again. Lord God, um, worship. it was so powerful today, Lord, from just the opening scripture, the worship, Lord. Lord, your presence was here, Lord. The heavens indeed are open, Lord yes. God, and we thank you, Lord God, that we are under an open heaven, Lord God. I thank you that we are together under an open heaven, yes. Lord God. Pour out, Lord God, your plans and purposes in this hour, Lord God. Dwell, ha Lord, let us be a habitation of your presence, Lord God. Yes. Lord, yes. what we had here today, Lord God, was amazing, yes. Lord, but it's not enough, Lord, to have you just visit. As Pastor said, Lord God, we need you, Lord, to be a habitation in this place, Lord God. Lord, be with us as we go home. Be with us, Lord, as we return back to work or whatever it is we do, Lord God. Open our eyes, Lord God. Lord, today, Lord God, I saw you, I heard you, I experienced you, Lord God, where I have not before, Lord God. And we declare, Lord, that under this open heaven, Lord, that eyes are open, Lord, ears hear, Lord God, and our heart will perceive and see your presence, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes.